Thank you all for attending. Uh, this is my class on sorcery in medieval Byzantium. Uh, my name is Valya Abnakova Doch, and um, later in the class, I'll put in the chat uh, my email, uh, and then um, I'm Valya Abnakova Doch on Facebook as well. Uh, you can see my name uh, on the on my name tag. Feel free to message me later for um, any resources that you want um for if you have any questions and uh, i would be glad to email you any of my pdfs uh a lot of them i got through my institutional access with my university so uh i understand that um that may not be an option for everybody so i'd be glad to share what i have uh as well as that i will have a list of sources up on the screen at some point so um feel free to contact me and get any of my information uh, and uh, I think I'm ready to start. So uh, first off, on Facebook, this is listed as uh, medieval witchcraft in Byzantium, and that's a bit of a misnomer. I'd like to draw a distinction between a few different terms here. Uh, normally, when we think of witchcraft in a scholarly setting, uh, we're talking about uh, folk religious practice or, um, or folk practice that is uh, tangentially connected to um, often pagan religion in the area or um, a corruption, as the church might refer to it, of Christian religion in the area or folk beliefs and practices that um, originate in small rural communities. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, in medieval Byzantium, there was a um, a practice among uh, mostly the upper class of uh, actual magic, as you would think of it, from um, tales like Merlin or uh, the notion of wizards. So think about um, grimoires or texts with rituals and discussion of theology and philosophy and a great merging of different cultural ideas about divinity and um, higher planes of existence and um, a practice of evoking often uh, beings referred to as demons and angels uh, who may carry names of pagan uh, deities. Uh, I'll get a little bit more into this later when we talk about what was specifically being performed but this is not a folk religion uh, or folk practice. This is not a practice of the lower class. Uh, this is a practice of literate, uh, very intellectual people who, um, who had access to these sorts of books and were performing uh, or studying rites that um, were taboo, but uh, was an open secret that they were being practiced. And uh, there's another couple of terms that I want to define here. Uh, there's a distinction that's drawn in the medieval world between sorcery and uh, acts like divination and astrology uh, that is not necessarily drawn in the modern day. When we think about telling the future or fortune telling or um, reading the stars or some sort of signs, uh, we lump that together with the sort of practice that they were doing of uh, calling forth um, other beings to do their bidding, which we're talking about this in a scholarly setting. So I will be referring to, the, to it as they understood it, um, but please be aware that this is, um, this is a scholarly discussion and um, it's, it's difficult to talk about what they believed and what they were doing without um, sounding a little strange. Uh, so we, we should put aside our modern thinking and uh, ideas about uh, what was actually happening to discuss this. Uh, this, is, this is a topic that a lot of scholarship has come about in very recent times, is people 
put aside their uh, modern notions of uh, superstitious um, uh, magic users and, and rituals that were being conducted. Um, and it's, it's a lens that we have to look through. So there's a distinction being drawn in the medieval world between telling the future and reading signs passively and um, actively calling out uh, to other entities to evoke uh, powers and bring those in workings into, um, into your day-to-day -day life. So uh, acts like sorcery were set aside from acts like divination and astrology, which were often uh, not necessarily endorsed, but were, um, were given much more leniency uh, in public opinion and in um, the opinion of the church. Uh, you have instances of court astrologers and of emperors in Byzantium calling upon um, magicians to tell their future or to, um, or to look at the stars and tell them uh, what they believe. Because the distinction here is between passively reading signs that are extant and that exist in the world and actively affecting change in the world around you. And so there's a type of uh, divination called scrying, uh, which was actually considered to be sorcery and not divination because it was actively evoking um, beings to tell you the future as opposed to passively reading signs. Uh, so, within medieval Byzantium, um, the general attitude toward uh, sorcery, as we understand it, uh, varied a lot. You have um, a lot of different reactions recorded in chronicles and in official documents from the church, as well as secular documents um, that show that uh, opinion fluctuated a lot. Um, there are a lot of thinkers uh, and philosophers, especially in the 12th century, with um, a chronicler named Michael Solos uh, and another chronicler named um, Anna Komnena, uh, who was the uh, daughter of a prominent emperor, uh, writing about uh, the times that they lived in and writing about history, and also writing commentary on um, metaphysical works and uh, writing about their knowledge about these works. Uh, you have a lot of philosophers looking into these works and gaining um, knowledge from that and making that very public, teaching their students about it, telling their students to read these works, um, but not necessarily uh, admitting to uh, actually practicing what was within because um, it was, taboo for, um, for secular, but, but especially for religious individuals to, um, to practice these works. So you have uh, instances here and there of the church coming out and condemning uh, these, um, these books and the people who practice what's within. You have um, instances of monks or other religious officials being censured or um, put on trial for allegedly practicing uh, sorcery. And unlike witchcraft trials, these are uh, in, the, in the later part of, um, of, of Western European history. These are uh, very formalized trials uh, with very little spectral evidence and um, a lot of uh, a lot of actual probability that uh, the acts that uh, the the monks were being accused of occurred, because um, it was, as I said, uh, a bit of an open secret that these things were being performed. Uh, you also have instances of uh, political character assassination where people are throwing accusations of sorcery or witchcraft at their opponents. Um, this is in the middle of, um, uh, mostly in the middle of uh, the iconoclasm controversy, which if you're unfamiliar, 
um, the Orthodox Church in Byzantium uh, had a an extremely um, uh, a very difficult relationship with icons in the eighth century. Uh, these icons were depictions of uh, religious figures like saints and uh, Christ, um, which were thought to be uh, conduits between um, those actual religious figures in heaven and uh, the people on earth who venerated them. And so there was a lot of controversy over whether um, this was uh, false idols being worshipped by the people or whether this was a permissible act. And so uh, during this time, there are uh, a lot of accusations of, um, of sorcery being thrown particularly at iconoclasts, which were the faction that um, denounced the use of icons. Um, and uh, there was a, a large back and forth of um, various uh, emperors who were iconophiles succeeded by emperors who were iconoclasts and uh, patriarchs uh, disagreeing and um, it was it was a very uh, politically charged time in Byzantine history and this is during the eighth century um, so right now I'm going to share my screen because uh, I've got a bit of a PowerPoint Hold on. All right, so here are some of my sources. Hold on, I think this is actually the last slide. All right. So here are some Byzantine sources uh, that are secular for, um, for sorcery being uh, evident and uh, an extant thing that was being practiced. I'm going to start here because um, it's important to look at the attitudes of the people of the time period toward these actions, which I'll cover in full a bit later. Um, most of these are chroniclers or chronicles, um, and you have uh, instances and quotes in the chronicles where um, people are again being accused of witchcraft. You have a lot of uh, chroniclers um, who were um, themselves philosophers and intellectuals uh, being students of the occult. Uh, Michael Solos in particular wrote a commentary on the Chaldean Oracles, which is a text I'll cover in a bit, and uh, boasted of his knowledge of astronomy. Uh, and uh, there's a, a wealth of information in these texts and from these authors that um, this was uh, a fairly common practice among the upper class. And just to give a bit of context to the uh, iconoclasm controversy, this is an image of the Hagia Sophia. Um, you can look past the more modern um, uh, decor and see all of the mosaics uh, in the dome. And uh, this is a mosaic that's been uncovered. Uh, and this is the Hagia Irene, which is also in Constantinople. It's the exact same floor plan and uh, the exact same dimensions, but um, this is an iconoclast church where the only mosaic is a large mosaic of the cross, um, and uh, it's bare of most decorations. So this is, um, this is evidence of the, the political background going into the eighth century, um, which was, resolved by the time of most of the chroniclers that I discussed, but um, which was a very evident uh, political background to a lot of the um, a, a lot of the writings and the actual like sorcery of the time. 
So here are some um, texts that were written in Byzantium or that were translated in Byzantium um, that uh, I'm, not, I'm not extremely familiar with. Uh, the main three texts I'll be talking about are the uh, Greek magical papyri, which uh, date from the second to the fifth centuries. Uh, the Greek magical papyri are, um, it's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, they uh, were largely written in uh, Alexandria, um, in various places throughout Egypt. And it's kind of a collection of papyri that bring together uh, a lot of different cultural references to um, Jewish, Jewish tradition, to Egyptian pagan tradition, to Greek pagan tradition, um, and a little bit of uh, Christian, uh, early Christian tradition that um, it's a whole manual essentially for uh, spells and rituals that is in many ways thought to be the progenitor of the uh, European uh, ritual magic um, movement, which is, um, it, it extends into the 15th century in Western Europe, and uh, it has its own heyday in Byzantium throughout um, the, around the 5th to the 13th centuries in Byzantium. Um, and uh, the Greek magical papyri are, although they were not written in Byzantium during this time period, uh, they are highly referenced in many, many Byzantine works and by many Byzantine um, authors. And so uh, as the, essentially the progenitor of uh, a lot of what's known as Solomonic um, magical tradition, which is attributed to uh, King Solomon. Um, it's a very notable set of works, and it's um, there are there is a vast wealth of information contained in them. Uh, and I'll I'll have some quotes from that in a little bit uh, to show you um, all of the various practices and rituals that were contained within these. And I've got a a, a copy of the translated Greek magical papyri. Um, that is available to me, which I will, of course, be glad to pass on to anyone uh, afterwards. Uh, another text I'll be looking at is um, the uh, Chaldean oracles, as I mentioned, uh, which it dates from the third to the sixth centuries. And the Chaldean oracles are different from the Greek magical papyri in that they're not they're not a handbook or a manual for uh, sorcery or for magic, uh, but it is a um, a very fragmentary text, which is pretty inscrutable. Uh, I'll have a couple of quotes from there in a bit, um, with commentary from Michael Salos, uh, a chronicler I've mentioned. Um, it's inscrutable theological, um, kind of theological, philosophical text, which was uh, attributed to um, a father and son, uh, Julian the Chaldean and Julian the Thurgian, um, in the in around the third to the sixth centuries in uh, Chaldea, which is a term for Babylon. Um, and it's, it's an extremely inscrutable work, as I've said, but um, a lot of scholarship in Byzantium throughout this time period uh, went into trying to understand it. And it was, um, it was positioned as a philosophical, as a very important philosophical and theological text in this time period. And so um, it forms a lot of the basis for the individuals who are practicing or studying sorcery uh, and what they what they understood um, 
I've got, I've got a work. Um, I, I have a, a, a PDF of a very large book that goes into the Chaldean um, oracles, theology, and the practices uh, contained within them. And it's, it's very difficult to follow. Um, I understand a, a small fraction of what was, uh, what was understood about them um, by Byzantine thinkers. And it's, I, I, I would be glad to transfer that to anyone else. Uh, I won't be talking too much about the nitty gritty of the Chaldean oracles because uh, to be honest, I, um, it's very hard <laughs> for me to follow. Even the, even the scholarly literature about it is, is, is very difficult when they break it all down. Um, but I would be glad to, uh, to give that to anyone who's interested. Uh, and the third text is the Hygromantea, uh, which is a Byzantine Solomonic uh, grimoire, which is thought to probably date around the seventh century with revisions around the 13th century. Um, I have not been able to find a free copy or a PDF of this anywhere online. I did find an affordable copy of the book in paperback, and so it's currently on its way to me. Uh, so I have not actually read the Hygromantea, but it, um, uh, I have a very good um, thesis that I've read about uh, the Hygromantea in the tradition of the uh, Greek magical papyri and how the one bleeds into the other and, um, and how they're related in, uh, in kind of a lineage of uh, magical tradition. And so it's very, um, it's very important work and it's, uh, it's very interesting and it relates highly back to the, I've put up here are the third bullet point, uh, translations of Arabic works, which uh, occurred in Byzantium. Um, which would have been available uh, or were probably available to uh, a lot of the people operating in Byzantium during this time period um, who were practicing sorcery. And so these are, this is a small sample of the many different grimoires which were extant in this time period and which were um, part of the library of practitioners who may have had access to maybe uh, one or two of these at any given time, um, depending on how widespread and common they were. We found many, many copies of the Hygromantea. There are many copies of the Greek magical papyri. Um, and although the Chaldean oracles are fragmentary, um, a lot of what we have surviving is from commentary. So, this is, uh, these are quotes from the Chaldean oracles um, with additional quotes from Solos uh, below them. So you can, you can kind of see the nature of these fragments um, and the kind of difficulty with um, piecing them together in any, uh, in any real way. Uh, the commentary from Solos helps a lot for, um, uh, for scholarly interpretation of these works, but it's a very difficult line to walk in piecing them together. And as I said before, I'm not going to try to explain what I've read about them because I'm not sure I would do it justice. Um, this is a map of um, Chaldea, which, as I said, is another term for Babylon. Um, and then this is from the table of contents for the Greek magical papyri. Um, so you can see uh, the <laughs> a, uh, a small sampling of the vast, um, vast list of rituals contained within them. There are pages and pages and pages within the table of contents of any copy of the Greek magical papyri because they're, um, uh, it, it's an extremely uh, comprehensive set of works uh, written in multiple different languages. Uh, Greek, um, 
some uh, demotic, uh, some Egyptian, and uh, some Hebrew. And it's um, it's just an awful lot of different uh, sorts of spells. You have love spell, victory spell, um, oracle questions, recipe for ingredients, um, and then um, types of amulet or charm that were often worn by um, either by practitioners or created for uh, petitioners who needed healing. Uh, I have examples of some amulets later in the PowerPoint. You'll see some pictures of them. So this is from the Greek Magical Papyri. It's the first um, set of uh, rituals. And so you can kind of see um, the nature of a lot of these rites. Uh, it says a daemon comes as an assistant who will reveal everything to you clearly and will be your companion and will eat and sleep with you. Uh, and then uh, describes how to go about the ritual and what you need to say, what uh, pictures and inscriptions you need to write and the ingredients of the ritual. And a lot of these rituals themselves are fragmentary, but um, a lot of great work has been done in piecing them together and showing what probably would have been practiced. Uh, here's another one with a uh, kind of a chant or a formulaic set of words. Uh, you can see here, there's uh, in the bottom, there's a set of inscrutable sort of names and um, and careful pronunciation of a set of words. This is uh, the commonly practiced um, belief that uh, magical words and phrases and the true names of various beings uh, were powerful and could themselves um, invoke uh, the beings that were being named and compel them to perform various tasks. Uh, you have in later texts like the Hygromantea, you have uh, a lot of tables and um, ritual, um, ritual practices that involve uh, different beings, be they angels or demons, or um, or pagan deities uh, who rule over different days of the week and different hours of the day that you have to invoke before uh, being able to uh, do your magical working uh, because you need their permission or you need to compel them to allow you to do these works uh, and different beings that rule over different workings themselves. So um, this is the forerunner for a lot of um, much more um, comprehensive and much more um, thorough uh, beliefs around ritual and the nature of ritual and uh, what needs to be done to perform these rituals. Here's another one. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, from the Greek magical papyri. Um, I'm just going to read this one. Uh, it says, keep yourself pure for seven days before the moon becomes full by abstaining from meat and uncooked food, by leaving behind during the prescribed days exactly half of your food in a turquoise vessel over which you are also to eat, and by abstaining from wine. When the moon is full, go by yourself to the eastern section of your city, village, or house, and throw out on the ground the leftover morsels. Then return very quickly to your quarters and shut yourself in before he can get there because he will shut you out if he gets there before you. But before you throw out the morsels, fix in the ground at a slight angle a verdant reed that is about two cubits long, tie some hairs from a stallion around the midsection of a horned dung beetle and suspend the beetle from the reed by them. Then light a lamp that has not been used before and place it under the beetle in a new earthenware dish so that the heat from the lamp barely reaches the beetle. 
Stay calm after you have thrown out the morsels, gone to your quarters, and shut yourself in. For the one you have summoned will stand there and, by threatening you with weapons, will try to force you to release the beetle. But remain calm and do not release it until he gives you a response, then release it right away. And every day during the period of purification when you are about to eat and go to bed, speak the following spell seven times. Uh, and then it uh, lists a spell, it lists uh, how to create a phylactery, uh, which is a sort of amulet that was worn by the practitioner during magical workings. Um, how to dismiss the being which you had summoned by uh, performing these works. Um, and uh, I, I really like this uh, specifically because it doesn't actually mention who the being is that you've summoned and, um, and what it is that, um, that the being can perform for you. It's, uh, it's kind of a fragmentary set of instructions that um, doesn't really explain anything about the working, but it's, it's extremely thorough and I just, I, I really enjoyed reading this. Uh, so this is a bowl. Uh, it's called the San Marco Bowl. Uh, the, the big picture you see here is actually a reconstruction of the bowl. Um, it's currently held in a church in, I believe, Spain. Uh, and the handles are not original to the bowl. So I, I first learned about uh, the phenomenon of Byzantine sorcery uh, from reading a, an article about this bowl called Meaningful Mingling by um, Alicia Walker, which is an extremely good article, uh, breaking down the imagery on the bowl. And um, the, the bowl, in essence, um, she argues, was uh, a bowl meant for divination. You can see the classical imagery around the sides depicting um, uh, Greek pagan figures in very uh, classical statuesque um, imagery. And um, she breaks down the meaning of a lot of these figures. One of them is uh, a diviner uh, holding a divining rod and compelling uh, various gods uh, to do his bidding. Uh, you can also see around the rim here and on the bottom and uh, I've included a close-up picture of some of this. This is pseudo-Arabic script. Um, it's meant to mimic Arabic, but it doesn't actually say anything. Uh, around this time in Byzantium, and this was uh, thought to have been made around the late 11th, early 12th century. Um, it's an enamel bowl uh, with gilding. Uh, around this time period, there was uh, a great, a great meeting of cultures between uh, the Islamic world, uh, the Byzantine Christian world, um, which still had uh, the legacy of the Greek and Roman um, world, which uh, came before it. Um, and this bowl kind of brings together all of these, uh, all of these different cultural um, impressions, which carry with them their own sets of associations. Um, you have the pagan Greek statues, which are, uh, which represent a, uh, a time which was thought to be, in the popular mind, uh, more magical and have more personal um, religion. And you have the Arabic, the, the pseudo-Arabic script, which was uh, at the time um, very, it carried very exotic and mysterious connotations to it. Uh, and since the average individual in Byzantium couldn't read Arabic, um, it hints at uh, secrets and mysteries and um, occult knowledge that was not known to most individuals. Um, and there is, uh, the crux of the article is a speculation that this was used for um, 
lacanomancy, uh, which is a type of augury or divination where uh, the practitioner looks into the bowl after pouring in oil or water um, and uh, sees images in the bowl. Uh, and I actually have a bowl divination uh, right from the Greek magical papyri saying, whenever you want to inquire about matters, take a bronze vessel, either a bowl or a saucer, whatever kind you wish. Pour water, rainwater if you are calling on heavenly gods, seawater if gods of the earth, river water if Osiris or Serapis, spring water if the dead. Holding the vessel on your knees, pour out green olive oil, bend over the vessel and speak the prescribed spell. And address whatever god you want and ask about whatever you wish, and he will reply to you and tell you about anything. And if he has spoken, dismiss him with the spell of dismissal, and you who have used the spell will be amazed. This is just one of many spells um, of bold divination and other sorts of divination or scrying uh, within the Greek magical papyri. There are many more in the Hygromantea. Um, and so when I, when I read this excerpt in the papyri, uh, after reading the Meaningful Mingling article, um, I just, I, I thought it was, um, it was, just, it was just a really interesting way of bringing, um, this sort of fantastical, uh, artifact, which is beautifully made, um, into the consciousness of, um, of the modern perception of, um, sorcery and magic and like it's it's just a really interesting artifact and um i thought it would be uh, really cool to show you i also have that pdf if anyone would, would want to read it i highly recommend it um another thing that um is found all throughout byzantium and uh russia during this period are called uh these are called uh, hysteria amulets, and this is a very small sampling from um, quite a lot of archaeological finds. You can see on the front side, it has an image of a woman surrounded by um, snakes, uh, often thought to be the head of Medusa. And on the back side, it has a Greek inscription. Um, this inscription uh, was often a, uh, a sort of ritual um, saying or phrase which um, called upon uh, various deities or upon God to protect the woman wearing the amulet from infertility. And so um, these are amulets which um, you see them in Russia often translated into Old Slavonic um, or are kept in the original Greek. Uh, you see inscriptions in Latin. Um, you see different amulets with slightly different inscriptions and uh, images of Christ on a crucifix. It's, um, it is uh, still more evidence of a widespread magical belief among, um, among the people which could be viewed in uh, endless grave sites and um, and archaeological finds throughout the regions uh, being discussed. So here are um, all of my sources. Um, my personal favorites, which I got the most out of, were Meaningful Mingling by Alicia Walker and Magical Techniques and Implements Present in Greco-Egyptian Magical Papyri. Uh, Byzantine Greek Solomonic Manuscripts and European Grimoires by Stephen Skinner. Um, the latter also goes into uh, grimoires from the 15th century from Western Europe uh, and how they are also connected to this, um, this kind of lineage of uh, magical texts going from uh, ancient, ancient Egypt um, to um, to often 15th century Europe. And um, it's, it's an incredible work. Um, the Chaldean oracles and Thergy text is not actually, um, it's mostly a breakdown of 
what the Chaldean oracles means. Um, there's the Greek magical papyri in translation, which is an incredible text. Um, and occult science and imperial power in Byzantine history and historiography is uh, also a very important work, which was uh, very interesting to read through. It goes a lot into statues, which were often thought to be um, representative of the people they depicted. Um, and so by doing violence to a statue, you were doing violence to the person on a metaphysical level. Um, so uh, there's a vast wealth of practices and of uh, belief systems that are evident in these um, periods of history throughout Byzantium. And it's, uh, it's just an extremely interesting topic. And um, that's, that's more or less all I have to say about it. Um, I'm going to take questions in a second. So I stop sharing my screen. There we go. If anyone has any questions, um, otherwise, thank you so much for attending. I'm glad I could uh, share this with you. We'll, we'll wait a minute if you want to to see if anybody's got any questions. Um, I, I'm muted people, so if you're on mute, you can't unmute yourself, let me know. So um, I was just wondering, um, the particulars of the rituals, like take a beetle and tie it with horse hair to the reed. Did you find anything about like how they arrived at this is the ritual you should do to achieve this effect? Or so um, there's, there's so much information condensed within all of these different rituals. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily possible to trace all of this, mm -hmm. but um, but the origins of a lot of these rituals are based in um, uh, Jewish texts from around the time, in Egyptian beliefs most prominently, um, in Greek or, um, or sometimes early Christian works. So uh, a lot of times if you go back to the source material and you see which uh, language it was written in, uh, originally, that will give you an indication of the source of the um, of the ritual ultimately, which uh, if you were interested in doing that sort of research would get you a long way to uh, understanding how these um, these rituals and these components came to be. Very cool. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions before we call it a day? Um, how did you say that we could reach out to you and request a copy of the papyri? Oh, that's right. So um, I will type my uh, email in the chat. Um, and on Facebook, I am Alia. Abnikova Doch. Um, and you can reach out to me through Facebook Messenger uh, or through email. Um, and I would be happy to answer any more questions uh, through that medium or, um, uh, or to send any copies of anything. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else? Hey, yeah, Lily. The um, are we there? Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, so you were saying that this was often that the sorcery was often practiced um within you know the upper class sort of folks. This was not folk uh, craft. Mm -hmm. it, did they? Was it was it something that was tended? Did they, did they hire a specialist, or did they tend to practice it themselves? Was it uh, was it something that that um, uh, was thought of as 
as something you did yourself or something you hired somebody for. Do, do we have any idea about that? So uh, it, it depends on um, who specifically you're talking about. Uh, a lot of the philosophers uh, that I discussed and the chroniclers claimed not to have practiced it at all um, or do endorse its practice. Uh, we're just reading about it. Um, if you were an emperor or if you were uh, a royal individual who, um, or, or, or a politician who had need of this information, uh, you were surely aware that it was out there. Um, and so there are uh, accusations and accounts of various uh, politicians consulting specialists who uh, could perform these acts for them, uh, mostly divination and fortune telling. But um, a lot of intellectuals uh, who were seeking out this information themselves would have uh, been able to perform them um, themselves without, um, without uh, necessarily uh, consulting other people for services rendered. Um, also, a lot of the uh, amulets and a lot of um, uh, cursed tablets and things of that nature were uh, mass produced. And so there were individuals who were creating these for um, a general audience and people who were purchasing them. Um, we don't know much more than that, but um, that's so kind of both, depending on who you were. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So what time period would this have been? So this is uh, throughout Byzantine history. So um, I specifically focused on about 5th century to 13th century. Um, uh, a lot of the chroniclers that I referenced were writing in the 12th or 11th centuries. Um, the grimoire, the Hygromantea that I mentioned was written in about the 7th century with um, um, with revisions in the 13th, but uh, throughout this, this period and uh, throughout the history of Byzantium um, and the Byzantine Empire, um, these texts, uh, or a lot of these texts, would have been available. Uh, and so there's, it certainly reached its height um, in about the 10th to 13th centuries, I believe, but, um, it was occurring throughout this time period. Um, earlier, you mentioned people being put on trial for sorcery. Um, what, what, like, what specifically was getting them in trouble? Was it just that they were doing sorcery, or were they like? using sorcery to like I'm, I'm thinking of like some of the english examples where it's like you know you're casting the king's horoscope and you're not allowed to do that or you're you know summoning a demon to like attack someone and that's a problem um so basically what are they getting in trouble for right so um in the trials that i've read about um and this is not exhaustive knowledge on my part, but uh, the trials that I've read were, they were getting in trouble because they were monks practicing sorcery. Um, because monks and uh, other religious figures were not allowed to perform these acts at all. Uh, and so it was not necessarily a, um, you performed X action, which we deemed to be harmful and dangerous, so we're going to try you. It was, we believe you're reading this or practicing this or doing this at all, and you're a, you're a member of the clergy, and so we're going to try you in ecclesiastical courts uh, for violating our rules on this. Any more questions? Wait, so would people, would lay people just not be tried? Like, so at all? Or you, is it just mostly 
monks? Uh, from what I've read, it's mostly members of the clergy uh, who are actually tried, but um, the court of public opinion definitely exists. And so accusations of uh, sorcery are levied against uh, political figures that you don't like, um, against uh, more members of the clergy that you want to be um, put on trial or exiled. Um, Michael Solos himself went through uh, a lot of troubles and I believe was uh, confined to a monastery um, outside of Constantinople for some time because uh, of his um, because of his practices and because of um, tensions that escalated to the point of accusations. Uh, and so you have, I don't recall reading about any um, instances of secular uh, individuals being actually put on trial, but you definitely have um, political careers being hurt, um, public figures being um, castigated for, uh, for the perception of having done this. So it was definitely a thing, it just wasn't necessarily tried. Hey, Varya, when we say trying, is this an ecclesiastical proceeding or court, or is it a, what we would think, a secular court? So the, the monks were tried in uh, an ecclesiastical court um, for violating their specific rules, but um, it was not a witch trial as would have been, as, as you may think of them. Um, it was the sort of trial heresy like you have a, con yes. a contract with the church to behave a certain way kind of like we think modern days of like a morals clause and you're trying me in the hr court if you will for my bad behavior not following what i'm supposed to be doing more so than breaking a law per se yes that's right okay thank you thank you 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 said at the beginning about like in like the later european witch trials there's more spectral evidence and I didn't really know what you meant by that. What's that? Right, so, so, um, so spectral evidence is, um, uh, this sort of evidence is stuff like uh, so-and-so dreamed that they had a spell being put upon them and then they woke up sick, or um, so-and-so um, had a vision that uh, this other person was participating in um, rites in the woods. And so that would have been permissible in certain courts in Western Europe during um, various uh, witch trials. But that was not a thing that was evident um, in this time period uh, in this region. Interesting. You know, try that next time I'm on trial for anything. Oh, I had a dream that I didn't do it. Thank you so much for attending. Uh